A local group of Korean Americans has a very nice way of expressing their gratitude to American veterans who served in the Korean War. Stay tuned to hear more. My guests are Donald Barker and Kenneth Goodman, who served in the Korean War. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a local group of Korean Americans uh, has a special way of thanking Korean vets, American vets who served in the Korean War, and we're going to hear more about your experiences with that group a little bit later. But for right now, we're going to learn a little bit more about what happened with you fellows when you were in Korea. Some stories you will be telling us, and I'm going to start with Donald. Donald, you were a student when the Korean War broke out, and you enlisted. And tell us about your time, your, what you did to serve there. Uh, I, I enlisted in the Navy in uh, September of 1950. <clears throat> uh, the reason I did that was, of course, the Korean War began on June 25th, 1950, in the pre-dawn hours. That's when the North Koreans uh, attacked. Uh, the reason I did that was I was uh, in the National Guard when I was 16 in my hometown, and it was an infantry unit, and I didn't want to be in an infantry unit because they were calling up some National Guard units. So I enlisted in the Navy. The Navy made me a corpsman. I went to Hospital Corps School. and. Uh, then they sent me up to Mare Island Naval Hospital, and the next thing I know, they had me down at Camp Pendleton at Del Mar at Field Medical Service School. And uh, then the following that, uh, they shipped me over to uh, Korea, and I found myself a platoon corpsman with the Marine Rifle Company over well, in the uh, Punch Bowl campaign. Now, tell us what your job as a, as a hospital corpsman was. You accompanied a platoon, there were two of you, I believe, who accompanied a platoon. Uh, and uh, yes, tell us about Maryland. that. That was uh, uh, with each rifle platoon in the Marine Corps, they have two uh, Navy corpsmen. Uh, and so I was uh, their doc, they were my Marines. And uh, so I was with the, uh, with the rifle company for uh, the platoon for the first six months in Korea. It Did you was, go out with them on all their uh, missions and oh so yeah, forth? You yeah, were, you were right there with them. We had, and you yeah. carried weapons, I yeah. suppose, as long as, as well as your medical kit. Yeah. Now, what happened when when there, someone was wounded in a, one of their skirmishes? You tr you'd treat them there on the spot. And on the then spot. That was the, uh, the first treatment. The thing was, okay. you know, stop any bleeding had to be stopped tourniquets, whatever was necessary there, uh, depended on the, on the conditions. Uh, some of the wounds were, were relatively uh, non-life-threatening. Others were somewhat quite life-threatening. So, so you would take them in, and you actually had field tent hospitals set up. Uh, yeah, well, there was a whole uh, uh, line of, of evacuation. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we treated those right there on the spot. Uh, we had serum albumin for fluid replacement. Uh, and uh, the next area that they went to was the battalion aid station. Uh, we had uh, helicopters in, uh, in Korea at that time. And uh, so the, uh, uh, the time of getting them back uh, was relatively short in many instances. Uh, but the, the question was getting them to the helicopter to begin with, mm -hmm. and that was a process. Uh, once, the, uh, once the wounded were back at uh, one of the field hospitals, then they had all the facilities there that were necessary. There and were, those were actually tents, right? Yeah, these were mm -hmm. tent hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, after my first uh, six months with the line come, now I was back at a battalion aid station briefly, and then back to a field hospital, E-Med, Easy Med. Uh, and uh, so that's where I spent the rest of my time in Korea, uh, was with Easy Med. So when they, they came back to the hospital, your, your field hospitals there, if they needed more treatment, further treatment, were, were then they transported elsewhere? 
Well, we had a hot uh, over there on the the uh, western front, uh, north of Seoul. We were at Munsan Ni. Uh, that was on the uh, the Highway One on the way up to Pan Mun John, um, and so. <clears throat> At uh, Incheon, which was right there at Seoul, uh, on the the uh, waterport there, uh, they had the hospital ship. The Consolation was there, and uh, so they had all the facilities there for uh, surgery and and so on too. Yeah. And how did you get them uh, onto the ship? Uh, that was interesting. Uh, they had what we called a rail bus. Uh, Munsan Ni was a had the rail line came up from Seoul and Incheon. Uh, to uh, Munsani, and uh, they had this bus which was modified to run on the rail tracks. So from uh, Incheon, they ran it up on the railroad tracks, and then we were, hospital uh, was right across the road from, um, from the railhead, and they uh, took the bus off the railroad tracks and, the ro and drove it over, and we put the stretchers inside, and then they went back to the railhead just across the road and down to uh, in China and the hospital ship. That's the way that worked. So you were um, there were you were involved more with the hill battles in the western part of Korea, and you wanted specifically. And I know you went through some very cold winters. Yeah. I hear that Korean winters are pretty bitter, but uh, you wanted to talk about the Bunker Hill battle in August of. 1951 was particularly uh, difficult for you and everyone else. Uh, yeah, that was uh, <clears throat> that was a, a significant uh, battle there. That was in August of uh, uh, 51, uh, 52 it was. Yeah, it was 52. Uh, August 15th. That's uh, that's when we got the first casualties from that. Uh, those hill battles were out in front of the, the main line of resistance never moved, but they had all the outposts out in front of the MLR. Um, and so the Chinese wanted that in the worst way. It was a high ground and uh, they wanted it in the worst way. So they were really after that area. There was some major battle going on there. There were several outposts up in that area. And the first casualties we received were on a Friday evening on the 15th of August. Um, and about an hour after sunset, that's where the first chopper came. It was a little bell with two two stretchers. Um, so that was the beginning, um, and that was on a Friday. So we'd been up all day Friday, and uh, from that point on, we we didn't get any any uh, respite from this until Monday afternoon. So we'd been up by the time everything ended, we'd been up 72 hours. Um, and we triaged uh, 1,004 wounded Marines during that particular time. Um, I worked in what we called minor debridement. We had all the extremities um, and anything you could do under local anesthesia. Um, we ran out of sterile gloves. We threw them, uh, the gloves in the Zephyr chloride solution, reused them. Uh, we uh, operated, by the time everything was over with, we had operated on 397 wounded uh, Marines. Um, in the uh, major tent, uh, I think they had 142. Uh, of course, those surgeries went on much longer, uh, many of them, than, uh, than what we were doing. Uh, so that was a major battle and uh, uh, memorable. Uh, I, I, I did notice, uh, read here, too, that they did like more than two surgeries in an hour. That's that's how fast they were working and how how much they had going on there. In the minor, in the major, in the major one, I think. Oh, in the majors. Well, maybe I'm I'm wrong. Yeah. It says uh, that 142 major operations under general anesthesia amputations and yeah. so forth, better than two an hour. So that just shows. Uh, how fast everybody was yeah, working. Some of those, they were working pretty fast. Yeah. Now, were you, were you involved in treating any of the Koreans? Or they had their own hospital for their soldiers, uh, didn't they? The, the uh, South Korean Koreans? Marine Corps, yeah. The Korean mm -hmm. Marine Corps had a, a hospital just adjacent to where we were. So mm -hmm. uh, we had some interaction with the Korean physicians and, uh, and their uh, military mm -hmm. up there. In fact, uh, I, I went up there, they wanted to, uh, the, some of the doctors wanted to practice their English conversation. So I got well acquainted with them. I'd go up there in the off time and we'd chat and, uh, and uh, 
So that was a good experience there. And then what about the, the civilian population? Uh, there were not supposed to be any civilians in that area, uh, but unfortunately there, there were. And uh, we treated uh, a little girl, I remember, she had uh, had some injuries. Um, and that's, that's the only one I can remember that we treated there, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I've, you have many more stories to tell, but uh, I was going to ask you, uh, Kenneth, uh, you uh, enlisted into the Air Force, and you be, were trained to be a combat, combat engineer, but you, uh, you have really bad um, PTSD, and you told me that you would uh, prefer not to talk about that, but you did want to tell about a story that happened to you when you first arrived in Korea at Pusan. And please tell us that story. When we got to Korea, we were put on a, a little convoy <clears throat> headed north, and all of these people were coming south, women and children, and occasionally an old, old man. Well, we stopped for the, to eat a meal, you know, sea rations, and there wasn't a man on that convoy that didn't give his sea rations away. Well, my brother and sister, Brothers 10 and sisters 12 years younger than I am, and I'm 18. I could see my little brother and sister mm -hmm. as one of these children. It made me feel very, very bad. And when we got back mm -hmm. to go, uh, I started to get up in the truck, and there was a little boy up there. And he says, I go with you. And of course, I, he couldn't. And I was almost in tears to make him get down out of that truck. Well, this, all this happening, I, I wrote letters to my mother and my girlfriend uh, telling them about this. Well, a few months later, the rest area, and a, a jeep pulled in. Two men and two great big boxes in the back. And one of them hollered, Sergeant Goodman, get in. I, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Dr. Seal, get in. The captain says, I'm a chaplain. And do you know Ruth French? And I said, yes, sir. She's my girlfriend. Shortly after, we come some rice patties, and there was a couple of little huts out in there with a bunch of children playing around. And we pulled down into the the area where they were playing, and so, and, and the boxes are sitting on top of me. Well, I got out, and he says, open them up, and I had no idea what was in them. And all the children came running, and there was clothes and food, and the children were just so happy and singing. My heart just about broke, and it just about cried. I guess I'm sentimental in that way. And that girlfriend of mine, she was my high school sweetheart. Well, you met her. She is now my wife. And she is continually devoted to children. Now, she collected from her church, didn't she? She went around and collected yes. the food and so forth. She, and you had said that you had been writing every letter you wrote home. You wrote home about the hungry children and their conditions of no clothes. and. You inspired her, and she inspired her church people to help out. And then there's an interesting thing that I heard, that you're in California now, and you recently were in a courthouse somewhere, and you met a Korean person. Tell that. In San Luis Obispo, in the courthouse, there's a cafeteria, and there was an elderly Korean man, and I was wearing his hat. So when I went to check out, he started asking me questions and so forth. And I said, yeah, I was in Korea and, you know, and all this. And about that time, my girlfriend, who was my wife, came up and she was saying that I had provided clothing and so forth for the refugee children. Well, this man said that he was an orphan, 
and that he was there, and he started crying. And that was just yesterday. Yesterday. And he was one of those oh. children that you gave the food and clothes to. What? Too bad he could have been here today, too. Well, thank you so much, Kenneth. That I'm thankful for hearing the story, and I'm thankful that you did that. So thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Now, um, the Korean American Senior Citizens League of Santa Clara County for about, uh, oh, maybe 20 years, has been giving um, dinners to American vets who served in the Korean War. Yeah. Uh, they, about 20 years they've been doing this, and they have an event where they <clears throat> give medals and, and certificates and plaques. We have one here. And uh, it's a thank you for what you all did. Now, we, you, you received those recently, and Donald, uh, you brought your plaque today, but you, Kenneth, you had a fire in your home recently. Everything that yes. you received was burned, but they are preparing replacements for you, just so you know that. They didn't have it ready for today. I was going to bring it, but they're still getting signatures from dignitaries and so forth. So you will be getting everything that that uh, wow, they gave I you. you. I didn't know that. Oh, well, yeah. thank you, thank you well, so much. Now, um, I have a little video uh, for us to look at. Um, Yon Suk Park, she's an active member of that group and former president. And uh, she wanted to be here today, she couldn't, so she did come to my home. And we did a little taping of her talking about her organization and about how they feel about the veterans. So um, let's take a look at that video now. Okay. As long as we are Korean, wherever they live, forever, we're going to honor the, the Korean War veterans. After they came to the United States and uh, they realized that that's what they should have to, uh, to show the appreciation. And so it was started in eight, 1988, so it's going to be about 29th year. If this event is a uh, appreciation from our part, we always remember the veterans. So it's really excited and it's covered with like a thanking and appreciation that that's the event. And then they, some veterans, they even cry, they burst in tears. And then some of them, it's a reminding them it's a horrible that the time. So their faces, some of them cry for joy, some of them cry for bad memories, but we, the event is always very uh, successful with all the thanking and appreciation. Through this event, we hope to remind and educate our younger generations who are not familiar with the Korean War history and sacrifices paid by American soldiers. Any Korean War veterans who fought during this, uh, the Korean War between June 25, 1950 to July 27, 1953 are invited to this event. So for the details, please call our office, 408-247-0605, and call me at 408-504-5687. Thank you.
How did you feel about what she had to say about your vet? Well, it, it just makes me feel proud and happy that I was able to help someone. And Donald, I know, want to hear what, how you feel about what they're doing for you. It's, it's a little dinner and it's a certificate, right. but it means a lot, doesn't it? Well, it, yeah, it's, it's very honoring uh, to, to have the uh, Korean community here, and it's, uh, it's a senior community that has done this year after year now. And it's something we always look forward to, um, and they uh, put on a program with uh, entertainment, uh, great food, and uh, it's a reunion type uh, event. Uh, so uh, it's an emotional time, uh, and it brings back memories of our, our days in Korea. Uh, but I know the Korean community here in the United States uh, never has forgotten and never will forget what uh, the Americans and the uh, United Nations, but mainly the United States, uh, did for South Korea. Uh, because there would not be a South Korea if it had not been for the Korean War and uh, our participation in that. I did uh, hope that I could ask you about your uh, volunteer time that you're doing for the, the, the injured Marines um, that are returning from Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, it's the Semper Fi Fund that you're involved with. Uh, that's right, yeah. The Semper Fi Fund was set up uh, back in 2004 uh, to uh, provide financial assistance uh, to our uh, uh, injured and their family members so they could be at the bedside during the uh, rehabilitation because uh, a major financial constraint for many families uh, to be away from their home and work and so on during that time and important for them to be there uh, at certain times. Uh, so the fund has been a major blessing, um, only 6% overhead, which is amazing mm -hmm. for, uh, for an organization like that uh, because it's, it's all volunteer. That's the way they can do it that way. And uh, so it's, uh, my uh, participation in that is at uh, the uh, hospital at Palo Alto VA and Menlo Park where they have the PTSD program. And uh, so I'm the interface between the fund and the, uh, and the injured and their families. Thank you both so much for coming and telling your stories and for serving our country and the people of Korea and serving our, our veterans of today here at home. We appreciate it very much. And I'm honored to have you both here. I was nervous and reluctant to come but now I'm glad I did. We're very happy you joined us for this program. We love having you, and we hope to see you next time. Bye for now.